It's because we're here today to have celebrate an adoption that happened in the church family, right? Amen. Yeah. And maybe a game. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. So thankful for each and every one of you being here in the um, clear sense of the Holy Spirit that is in the room this morning. Every Sunday at Alders Gate, we gather together for singing to center ourselves, get us, as someone said this morning, getting ourselves to land here, not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally, getting us here, and then praying to continue that, and then entering into the Word together. Thank you for sharing your prayer requests this morning. Uh, many, I actually got like three texts right before worship. People know how to reach me. Uh, also for filling out the prayer sheets at the back of the room as you can in. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Lord God, what a gift it is to be here today. We know that we could only be here, God, first is if you gave us our faith so that we knew we wanted to come. That you gave us this specific congregation to come to, this place, this building, and these people. And that, God, you gave us the ability, the help, and the, the working car, and the things that we need. So thank you for allowing us to be present this morning. God, we're very aware of the joys that are uh, amongst us today. But first, God, we begin with our prayer requests for those for whom we're concerned. Now, there's many in prayer we think of you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Alright, young ones, come on up. Thank <laughs> you. 
right? And he's keeping him from stepping too forward on, onto the field. And the thing that really struck me when I looked at that was that he didn't go smack. Because if somebody were coming up to pull me out of the way all the time, I'd be really annoyed, right? But instead, he, was, he didn't stop what he was focused on. But you know that he, he was thinking, thank you, right, for keeping me safe and keeping me off the field. That's right, because he was so focused on the game, he needed someone to help him stay safe. And when I saw that, I said, that just absolutely reminds me of God. That is what God is doing. We're walking along, we're really focused on our game, whatever it is, and God's like, hey, ooh, ooh, step aside. And we're like, hey, psh, God, I was going there. And we get mad about it, right? And we keep on going over here, and God's like, oh, let's step back. And we're like, oh, I had plans, God, boom. Right? A lot of times that's what happens. I'm speaking in a metaphor, but you saw the book. Um, a lot of times it's how we feel when our, our plans or our, what we're focused on gets a little bit shifted. Um, but I really think it's a great help. It's a great help when God changes our plans on us. Because sometimes God is keeping us safe from things or keeping us from getting too far out in the field and causing whatever problem that causes. And um, So I appreciate that coach. So when you watch the game today, if you stand and watch the game, see if he is this guy there who's correcting him. And think, that guy reminds Pastor Rachel of God. And you can tell the adult next to you. Do you know why? It's because he keeps you safe, just like God keeps you safe. And the adult will be like, wow, you guys are genius. That's amazing. Okay, today you have songs to Sam. You will be learning a song that you will sing for us next Sunday. And we're excited to hear whatever it is. All right, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for tugging us out of the way when we need it. Um, so that we can, we can stay focused on the game that you have for us, God, in a safe way. God bless and protect these kids. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we move towards the reading of the psalm, which we do because we ought to be reading from our Bible every week, every day even better, um, I want to draw your attention to the Ways to Make a Difference sheet in the bulletin. If you want to pitch in just a little bit one time to help out at Alders Gate, this place runs on volunteers, so these are the upcoming ways that uh, we need help, uh, including the breakfast coming up a week, uh, this coming Saturday, all sorts of things related to that, and then a private party, a uh, building rental that will need some help um, closing up in a couple of weeks. So thank you for looking at that. If you can help, just stick it in the offering plate when the offering comes by. Our psalm this morning is the first six verses of Psalm 71. Let's read it together. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, to which I can always go. Give me the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of those who are evil and cruel. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. And now please read the scripture lesson from the Gospel of Luke. Yes? Yes. Yes. So the fourth chapter of Luke, starting with verse 21. He began saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? Yes. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Total, truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people of the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of town. 
And they took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Before we get started, I suspect that I'm going to forget the second video about it. So just remind me, because I really want you to. Okay. In case I get on a roll, thank you, Paul. Okay. Let's pray. Dear God, we are very grateful to be here. We're grateful for your word, spoken so long ago, but made fresh in our lives because of the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would allow our minds and hearts to be open during this time and allow me to speak and to think clearly. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So being aware of um, this major event here happening in New England, uh, these, this football game, I thought, let's do everything we can to have as much football in the service as we're able. And the only wrinkle is that um, I don't know a whole lot about football. Um, I've shared this with you before. My favorite thing about football is the food that comes with watching the game and hanging out with people, but I don't understand the rules very well or the terms, and so I always feel dumb. So instead, I decided I would bring up an expert in football that I could interview about a very important event, so big I even heard about it last week uh, in the, the playoff games last week. So Kevin, why don't you come on up? <laughs> I don't know how you want to do this, but the video is queued up ready to go first minute of that video. And we can maybe even watch it and we can talk about it. First, first of all, I'm not an expert, but I watch a lot of football. So here we have the NFC Championship game. Uh, they're getting ready to play a third down play, I believe. Uh, well, it could be the first one. I can't remember. So New Orleans Saints has the ball. They're on offense. The Rams are defense. Throws a pass. Obviously, the defender uh, cleared out the receiver. Um, defender was in the uh, white. Receiver was in the black. Um, they're going to show it again. The defender was out of position, so he had no play on the ball. He never turned around to look at the ball, so that would be a penalty, as an interference call right there. He also hit the uh, Rams player, I mean, New Orleans Saints player, before the ball got there. That also would have been a... Uh, interference call. And then thirdly, if you watch, the helmet of the defender hit the uh, offense, uh, the receiver's helmet as well. He hit it with the crown of his helmet. So there's three penalties in that brief spot. Three penalties. So back up one more time so we can see it. So the white guy, the white shirted guy, banged it to the black shirted guy in a totally wrong way. Perfectly stated. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's watch the last break. I think you can't even see it the first time. It happens so fast. Drew Brees is getting ready to throw the ball. Throw the ball. Three penalties in that one. Let's watch one replay. Now I feel like I'm learning things. Watch the defender. He never turns his back to look for the ball. He hits the receiver, hits the receiver with his helmet, and hits the receiver before the ball even got there. That's the best view right there. Okay. So the real problem with this, Kevin, I mean, so it would be fine. I mean, that's not fine. But there's usually due process in this case where someone says, hey, the guy got the ball, or well, it was bad. Right? Somebody will say that. So what's normally have happened after a play like that? In this case, um, you don't have a review of a play on a non-call. You could review a play if something was called, but on a, when a referee makes a, a call or doesn't make a call, there is really no review. However, the uh, commissioner from football... So you're saying they didn't call that? They, it was a non-call. They just didn't either didn't see it or saw it or didn't feel it was a penalty. And that, according to every single person in the whole country, was Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So do you want to say any more about that? I think that's good. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Kevin White. Thank you. So um, people were really upset about that. I think there was even 
met a congressperson who asked for an investigation in Congress about that. I mean, people were really mad. Because what we understand, and, we, and, and I got this piece, that the Saints probably should have won that game, but because that wasn't called, they didn't win the game. And they didn't get to go to the Super Bowl. And so this is like profoundly unfair, right? People are irate. People are weeping at the injustice. I actually was, when I was watching that tape and looking at the coach, I just, I thought, like, what is he thinking? What is he thinking today? Man, that was not fair. That was completely unfair. Why did that happen? His team should be in the Super Bowl today, according to him, according to most people. Why did it happen? It was so unfair. We don't like it when things are unfair. Our whole country and our set of laws is based on equal justice before the law. The founding of this country has to do with the fact that nobody is above the law, not the wealthy, not the people in power, right? Everybody gets the same standard applied to them. It is absolutely woven into who we are as Americans. We understand this system of fairness. And we keep on refining it to get better and better, don't we? We're like, oh, wait, like, how many years ago? We forgot the black people. Oh, wait, we forgot the women. Oh, wait, we forgot the gay community, right? And so we just keep on trying to do better and better and get more fair so that every single person can have a fair process. That is absolutely part of our American identity. And so not only is this an offense to sport, but this is an offense to America. And you can quote me on that. <laughs> because this is not how we do things. We like an equal standard for every single person in every situation. That's true. OK, now think about your kids if you have kids. Or if you're a teacher, think about the kids in your classroom. Or think about the kids that you have now. Let's say child number one is a pretty straight arrow, he's a pretty good kid, generally you're not worried about him, think he has good judgment, and he does some little screw up. You'd be like, okay, well, that's a good kid. You know, I'm not generally worried about that kid. And so you say, hey, you know, shape up, whatever, things happen, I trust you to do a better job later. And then child number two is somebody that you've started to be concerned about. They haven't been honest with you, they don't have a whole lot of integrity, um, they, I don't know, you've seen trouble at schools, trouble, trouble among friendships, and they do the same little screw up. Your reaction is not going to be the same, is it? Because you know your children, and you're going to say, this one I'm not worried about. I know them so well, I'm their parent, I understand them inside and out, and so, you know, event one, A, whatever it is, is no big deal. Event A, with the child that you're very concerned about, is a very big deal. It turns into something different, and your reaction, your response as a, as a parent, appropriately, is different. Are you with me? Is that fair? Because the child is going to come up to you and be like, that's not fair! So-and-so did exhibit A also, and, and you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm the mom. Tough. I'm not worried about that guy. I'm worried about you. Like, stop messing up, right? Not fair but still right. Okay, interesting. The people of Israel felt that they had been treated unfairly by God in a teaching that Jesus gave. Jesus, one of the first times he sat down, teachers then sat down to teach, so I'm going to stay here. Um, they, he sat down and he read some scripture to them, and then he said, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, meaning that Jesus himself was a fulfillment of that scripture, which was a startling thing to say. And the people started rumbling and grumbling. He was in his hometown. They said, he said, of course you don't like me in the hometown. Nobody likes a prophet in their own hometown. And then he says this. Now, he's talking to Jewish people, the chosen people of God. They understand that they are God's favorites, okay? That's their identity. We are God's first and favorite community. And he says, you know, there were many widows in Israel when Elijah provided for a widow. But Elijah didn't provide for a Jewish widow. He went way over there to Zarephath. Wait a minute. God's supposed to take care of God's people first. God loves us most. And God's going across the border over there to take care of a widow who doesn't necessarily know God? That's not fair. And then he makes it worse. I'm like, whose side are you on? If Jesus had a PR manager, his ministry would not have been effective at all because he did all this scandalous stuff. 
And then he says, there were many in Israel with leprosy at a time when a prophet named Naaman, or a leader named Naaman, was healed with leprosy who was not from Israel at all. God chose to heal the person outside the community of Israel instead of one of God's favorites. And the people said, hey, that's not fair. And they were really, really angry with him. They got so angry with him, they decided they were going to run him out of town and run him off a cliff. And do you want to know what Jesus did when they tried to run him off a cliff? This is the video clip. I put it in here. This is what he did. They tried to run him off a cliff.
the way that you're moving to redeem, to bring new life, to bring healing, even with this terrible bad news. And go back. So we have some people here this morning who I just met with in this last year, and most of us, many of us met just within this last year, uh, Julie Bailey and Dan Salmier. Um, it's been such a privilege to know you, and you are some people who could really shout why, right? Just knowing your story that you are going to share with us a little bit today, too, um, about circumstances of your life. You go, ah! And instead, you looked for what God was doing and found a really beautiful story. So I want to invite um, Julie and Dan and anybody else that you're having come forward. Um, the three kids. That's okay. <laughs> come up to talk about an adoption that happened this week on Thursday, I think. That was finalized on Thursday. Oh, they're going to go get the kids. Okay, keep talking. <laughs> keep talking. Okay, but there they go. Nope, that's not it. The children have escaped. <clears throat> anyway, the adoption was finalized. Uh, but Julie will tell you the story of their family and how they came together. We also have some pictures of the adoption ceremony that happened this week. So they'll come and do that, and then we will have a prayer to bless then do some introductions first in case everyone has mentioned it. You'll do right Hi everybody. Thank you so much for celebrating with us this morning. Um Julie Bailey, Dan Salnier. This is Ben, uh, who we prayed for at Wilderness, who's back with us. <laughs> uh, doesn't love standing in front of a crowd, but <laughs> he's going to do his 13-year-old best. This is uh, Sean, our middle son, and Andrew, our little son. <laughs> uh, so we're just going to share a little bit of our story, um, and I think they're going to put a few pictures up of Adoption Day, which was just this Thursday. So. Do you want us to go while you're talking, or after? Totally up to you. We'll leave it to the PowerPoint team there. <laughs> Um, and let's hope that God will give me a little bit of strength to get through this. So, today we celebrate the official union of our forever family. It is not the beginning of something new. It is a celebration of our commitment to forever. Dan and I met in the summer of 2013 and began a friendship. We were living two separate lives, but we were both facing challenges, and we were both extremely fulfilled by our roles as parents. These common threads kept us talking, and every day we made a point to remind each other to keep trying and always tried to make each other laugh. I met Sean and Andrew through their mom, Stephanie, in 2015 when they were three and six, following an accident that involved the family dog, Falco. Is your vet? As a veterinarian, <laughs> dogs have played important roles my entire life. And the dog did fine, because I didn't put that in here, just to let everybody know. But I certainly did not foresee the series of events that would follow when Dan reached out to me that day for help. Through the months that followed, Steph shared with me many of the things that were important to her. She wanted to know that the boys would be safe, that they would stay kind, which they have, and that their lives would be positive, happy, and filled with love even though she knew she would not be with us because she was terminally ill, and she knew she would spend time in heaven after this. In the years that followed, friendship and support for a dad and his boys gradually grew into love. Ben was used to being my only child, it took a little bit longer to see that indeed we had room for all of us, right? <laughs> The relationship that Sean and Andrew formed with me was always free to develop at whatever speed they wanted. I had no expectations. I was happy supporting Dan as his role as their parent. The support that he needed will be, was and always will be, large. He has difficulties with PTSD and short-term memory after 26 years in the military, which we're all very thankful for, his service. It proved to be more significant than I had realized. We were often writing and rewriting this book because there certainly didn't seem to be a manual telling us how to navigate this path. We both quickly realized that in order to give the kids the life we want for them, the security they needed, it was going to require two fully committed parents. 
As a partner, I was able to help Dan see and build on his own strengths. He's a loving father. He's someone who can literally fix anything, Rachel and Amy. <laughs> I knew I was lucky to have him as my partner. When I told him that our medical bills this year to help our men would be unthinkable, he responded, will we lose the house? I said, no, but would we still do it if we would? He said, yeah, we'll do whatever we needed. I just want to know if we're going to lose the house or not. I said, all right. <laughs> Last year, Sean asked me if it would be okay to start calling me mom. Andrew agreed that would be a good idea too. A few months later, during dinner one night, we asked if everybody would like to make our family official. These three cuties started jumping all around, hugging, yelling, bros for life. <laughs> so we took that as a resounding yes. <laughs> we formalized that commitment through adoption this Thursday. And to quote somebody that wasn't me, family isn't always blood. It's the people in your life who want you in theirs. The ones who accept you for who you are. The ones who would do anything to see you smile and who love you no matter what. Thank you everybody for celebrating our special day. to what you were doing, even when it was sort of strange and confusing, uh, that, that trusted you, and that you have blessed with feelings of affection and love and provision for stability and protection. God, we ask that you would watch over this family, now official in the eyes of the law, and certainly God in your eyes as you have seen fit to bring them together. We ask that you would give them years of health and happiness, and that you would provide richly for all of them. We pray in Jesus' name. to celebrate the Lord's Supper together as the first Sunday of the month is our tradition. In the Methodist Church, the communion table is open. That means that it is between you and God, whether or not you come. So the invitation is yours. Uh, if you're comfortable to come, we serve gluten-free bread and grape juice so that everyone can participate. When the ushers uh, come to your row, you're invited to come up to the front of the kneeler rail and to kneel, and you'll be provided the elements, the grape juice, and the bread. Uh, you're welcome to consume them as you receive them, but stay at the rail until you're dismissed with a prayer. When you go back to your seats, please go back through the center aisle and the side aisle if you're on that side. Uh, if you go back this way, watch the camera set up. Please. Lord be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were uh, brought forth, you had formed in us your image. You brought us, you formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through the prophets. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ in whom you revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. In his baptism and table fellowship, he took his place with sinners. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set them at liberty, all those who were oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is blood, the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The table is prepared. Please come. <coughs>
Arise and go into the world to do God's work.
Now having been fed in both body and spirit, arise and go into the world for God's work. now time for our offering. Let us pray. God, your gifts to us are so evident, including among them are the provision that you give for us to live our lives. We ask God that you would receive this contribution back to you, knowing that it first came from you as an expression of our thanks and gratitude. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for our last song. There is a typo in the bulletin, but the words behind us are correct.
few announcements for us this morning. Uh, we, uh, Bailey and Sally, our family, have brought us quite a spread. Uh, so lots of treats after church. Please stay and eat. And for the first two minutes of that time, will you please talk to someone that you don't know, that you haven't met yet? Um, or whose name you don't remember. This is the official blanket. You don't have to be embarrassed for not remembering someone's name at the time. It's only two minutes long, so get there fast. And Sam, sorry, it's me. Um, so do remember the two-minute rule. Also, uh, I know that um, George Schofield has two announcements. Nice and loud, George, right there in the back, if you want to turn and listen to George. Um, first announcement is if anybody is interested in getting instructed on how to use the dishwasher and stoves. They're just a little bit different than um, your household models. Let me know and um, we will take care of that. The second thing is um, after church today, uh, I'm going to break down the sanctuary and put the pews to the side because Brother Johnson is having um, a small event. If you feel so inclined to help, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, George. And the reason people need new training on the dishwasher and the stove is because the kitchen is pretty much brand new. I just wanted to bring you a report uh, from the big community celebration we had last weekend, which was a fundraiser and party because of the new kitchen, uh, that it looks like, in total, we cleared just over $5,000. How do you like that? Even more important to me was that we had over 150 people in here celebrating with us from the community and people felt connected to the church. So thank you again to everyone uh, who did that. That means we only have 14,000 left. <laughs> That's a big deal. All right, fantastic. Don't like to talk about money, but I knew you wanted to hear that detail. Good. Well, oh, yes. So the bishop um, of the United Methodist Church in this area wasn't able to come to the party last Saturday, but he was here yesterday for a meeting. And so I said, Bishop, come look at the kitchen. And so we stood for that picture, and then he prayed for our kitchen. So I just wanted to let you know that he was here, and he said thank you to everyone who's worked so hard on this. Bishop Devonar. Okay, what else? Um, next. Oh, yes, next weekend. On uh, Saturday is our free-for-all breakfast from 8 to 10.30 on the Ways to Make a Difference sheet. You saw how to sign up for help. Also, come to eat. It is free and it is wonderful. Last month, what, 138 served, Rob. So we look forward to that. Also, next weekend after church, we will be having um, a meeting for anyone interested to attend about the national, actually the international United Methodist Church is right now having a huge fight about human sexuality. It's super dramatic, but it's like really far away from us, but still it could affect us. Um, there is a commission on the way forward um, that has been assembled, and the people will be meeting this month, February, in a specially called meeting in St. Louis, about 600 delegates, to talk about ordination and marriage and these very, you know, this church is really progressive, and we're in a really progressive area, but we belong to a global church that doesn't see everything as we do. So, um, interesting times to live in if you want to talk through church politics and movement of the Holy Spirit, uh, please uh, come to that meeting uh, next Sunday after church. The general conference is the week of February 17th, the week of February vacation. All right, uh, there are sign-up sheets out in the foyer to read the scripture, to stand as a greeter, to act a light, and to bring coffee hour. I would love it if y'all just filled those sheets up for the next coming weeks. I think that is all the announcements. And so now we need to do celebration and thanks. We always thank someone uh, for volunteering to help around the church. As I have said, the place runs on volunteers. So who are we thanking this week? Do you have one, Lucy? No? Okay. Norma, who will we thank? The group that um, redid the floor out of the foyer. It looked wonderful. Yes. Actually, I will t the, the foyer floor was stripped and rewaxed this week, so let's give those people a hand. <laughs> that is holy work uh, doing that. But I will tell you that the little meeting here yesterday afternoon was all church folks from different Methodist churches around. And they, the first two to walk in the door, look at these floors. <laughs> I was like, yes! And the bishop was here to see them, so I just felt like, gold star, gold star. So yes, thank you, thank you. 
All right. Please stand for the benediction. May the God who helps us answer the questions of why and especially what are you doing here, may that God and the presence of God's Spirit be with us all until we meet again. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.